let's take a look at the other half of solving the climate crisis and how it is we're going to feed ourselves and the world, which is regenerative agriculture. We live in a world that's changing. The pandemic has upset just about everything across the planet. It is the second global problem that we face, the first being climate change. This is not the end of times, but things are gonna get worse before they get better. Hopefully though, we will learn some lessons. One of the lessons we learned is that in a global pandemic, in a, in a global shock, the big supply chains break down. Our food supply chain globally broke down, particularly where it was dependent on industrial agriculture and stores started running out of food. I didn't, these are some of my cows, my husband walking along with them. This is Loki at a little local slaughterhouse. Loki is now in my freezer. In the pandemic, local processing, local farmers markets did very well as the global supply chain collapsed. Climate change is affecting agriculture. This was the bomb cyclone that hit Colorado a few years ago, wiped out a lot of the herds and then melted and flowed east into Nebraska, flooding much of the farmland. In some parts of the Midwest, farmers were unable to get their equipment into the field pretty much the whole summer. We know how to solve the climate crisis at a profit, renewable energy and regenerative agriculture. If we are going to hold global warming to under two degrees C, we have to take carbon out of the air and put it into the soil. If we increase soil carbon 2%, that would offset all of humanity's emissions. So if we double that, offset it 4%, we will begin to eat down the atmospheric carbon, putting it back in the soil where it belongs. To do that though, we have to stop treating the soil as dirt. Through the spread of cities, through desertification, we're losing farmland. The amount of arable land, land you can grow food on, per capita, per person, shrank almost by half and will continue to decline. And much of our best farmland is not owned by farmers now, it's owned by foreign countries, by corporations, who would you rather have responsible for, care for caring for the land? A big company or a farmer who understands that piece of ground? Agriculture as it is currently practiced is very energy intensive. We used to produce more than two calories of food for every calorie of energy input. Now it's 10 calories of fossil input to produce one calorie of food. Agriculture is water intensive. 70% of the world's water withdrawals go to agriculture, and this is increasing. It's also very polluting. There is no major river leaving the continental United States that is fit to drink or swim in. The World Food Organization warns that if we continue farming as we have done in ways that erode the topsoil, that poison the land, we may have only 60 more years of harvests left. And we know how to do agriculture right. We know how to build healthy soil, minimize the use of fossil energy, use locally appropriate crops, use a whole systems approach to farming. One of the early pioneers of this was Bob Rodale, founded the Rodale Institute. He helped bring on the organic food movement, 
but then decided he didn't so much like the term organic because all the big companies jumped in and took over the term, degraded the meaning of it. He prefers the term regenerative agriculture, which is agriculture that improves everything it touches rather than extracting value, nutrients, topsoil from the system. It encourages continual innovation for environmental, social, economic, and spiritual well being. The great Indian activist Vandana Shiva says that regenerative agriculture is the answer to the soil crisis, the food crisis, the health crisis, the climate crisis, and the crisis of democracy. What do we mean with regenerative agriculture? It is agriculture that uses plants that are appropriate to that area and management techniques that are appropriate. So this is Marty at the Land Institute holding a piece of Kernza wheat. Kernza is a perennial wheat. It comes up every year from the same set of roots. As a result, the roots can get very, very deep in the soil. And when the plant photosynthesizes, takes carbon out of the air, and the roots either die off or slough sugars, that feeds the soil community that mineralizes the carbon in the soil. Above Marty are uh, little rows of annual wheat. You have to break the soil and plant it every year. Little shallow roots. So Patagonia has teamed up with the Land Institute to produce long root ale, beer made from kerns of wheat. Now, Approaches like this can't possibly feed the world, can it? We need big industrial agriculture. That's what big agriculture tells us. The UN Conference on Trade and Development came out with this report, wake up before it's too late, saying only smallholder agriculture can feed the world. It is what feeds the world today. And there is no way that big chemical intensive Me mechanically intensive, energy intensive agriculture can feed the world. What we need is to enable smallholder farmers the world around to use the best agroecological techniques to use holistic management. In Africa, smallholder farmers produce 70% of the food that's eaten there on less than 15% of the available agricultural land. And using agroecological farming methods can dramatically increase food farming productivity. Doing this protects local culture, creates jobs, better uses resources, grows healthier crops, and builds resilience in the system as it fights climate change. This man, Alan Savory, developed holistic management, the management technique that seeks to fight climate change by reversing desertification, desertification caused by bad management techniques. When the pioneers first came across the Great Plains of the United States, they found 10 feet of thick black soil. That black is carbon. It got there because of the coevolution of grazing animals and grasslands. Two thirds of the world's carbon is in the grasslands. It's the world's second largest carbon sink. And yet we are desertifying the grasslands by managing them badly with industrial agriculture. Alan said, if we graze animals on grasslands, mimicking how the bison roamed across the American Great Plains or the wildebeest in Africa or the Sega antelope across Asia. Dense pack because there were predators. If you're about to get eaten, the safe place to be is in the middle of the herd. They eat everything in front of them. They trample everything under them. They fertilize everything behind them. They move on, they don't come back 
until the grass regrows. Doing this can repair even damaged rangeland, doubling the carrying capacity, even on degraded lands. And I know this works. I got in a fight with uh, George Mombio, who's a vegetarian, who was saying, you just need to get rid of cattle. I said, no. You need cattle managed properly. It's not the cow, it's the how. And I know this because I did this on a thousand acres of ground that I was managing. The land had been set aside as to be preserved. But what happened was it was invaded with noxious weeds. It was eroding. The grass would grow up and fall over and thatch in and only the weeds could get up through it. We brought cattle back, dense packed using electric fences. And within two years time, we had restored the land. The bison were dense packed by predators. Today we do it with electric fencing, opening and closing water holes. And the results are dramatic. The picture on the left, this, is, this picture is shot from a bridge in Wyoming, looking north, looking south. The left-hand side is holistically managed using Allen's approach. The right-hand side is conventionally managed. Same bridge, same day, same part of Wyoming. The difference in the grass is the management. And yet the holistic management enabled them to more than double the carrying capacity. South Africa, same thing. The right side is conventional management. The left side is holistic management, regenerative agriculture. You can do this to reclaim land. This is land where they turned the cattle out, fed them, and with six inches of rain, not a lot of water, they got grass back. Acid mine tailings, turn the cattle out, feed them on the ground, and the left side is where grass has regrown. The right side is where they've been trying hydroseeding and all sorts of conventional restoration technologies. The Savory Institute is doing this on millions of hectares of ground around the world, enabling farmers, ranchers to learn these techniques and apply them. Again, the proof is in the people who are doing it. This is Joel Salatin. He farms in Swope, Virginia, the upper end of the Shenandoah Valley. He took over what he said was one of the worst farms in the area and now raises a variety of meat, of vegetables, honey, and educated students. He grows what he calls salad bar beef. He has a diverse species, set of species of grasses and other plants that the cattle love to eat. He turns the cows out, again, intensively grazing a piece of ground for a short period of time and then moving the cattle. Then he brings in the pigs, calls it his piggerator. The pigs root in the ground and help till the manure in. These are the cows waiting to move from yesterday's salad bar to today's. Then he brings in the chickens, calls them chicken tractors. These are movable cages with hens that are wandering around eating bugs, breaking up the manure, or more permanent houses to winter them in. And he moves these across the land. As a result, there are no bugs, the chickens eat them. He doesn't need to use pesticides. He doesn't need to fertilize it. The animals are fertilizing the ground. Will Harris at White Oak Pastures took over his family's cattle farm. He's now the fifth generation on that. 
committed to Alan Savory's approach of holistic management. On his 2,500 acres, he has 137 employees. His neighbor commodity peanut farmer on the same acreage has four employees. As a result, the little town of Bluffton, Georgia is coming back to life. People have money, they're investing it locally. He produces five kinds of grass-fed red meat, eggs, organic vegetables. He built his own slaughterhouse because he wanted to be sure that the animals were treated humanely and that the value add stays in South Georgia. Meet Gabe Brown. Gabe's a North Dakota corn soybean farmer who's doing commodity farming and going broke. And he said, I'm going broke, I'll try anything. So first he went to no-till, he stopped breaking the soil. Then he planted cover crops, deep rooted crops. Then he brought on cattle to clear the cover crops so he could drill seed his corn and soybeans. He's not going broke anymore. He's doing very well and he can't keep up with demand. When he started, his soil was shallow, less than 2% organic matter. He now has plots of as high as 15% soil organic matter. Every 1% soil organic matter is five to 10 tons of carbon per acre. Gabe is taking carbon out of the air and putting it back in the soil. He says carbon is key to profitability on the farm. It's key to the nutrition of the plants. It holds moisture in the soil and it's what drives farm profitability. What Gabe is using, what Will's using, what Joel's using, what all these farmers are using is the natural life in the soil, particularly the mycorrhizal fungi. This is what mineralizes the carbon that the plants bring down out of the air. The health of the mycorrhizal fungi, the health of all of the biological life in the soil is key to regenerative agriculture. The soil on the left is full of carbon. The soil on the right is really just sand, it's dirt. Forest soil has 4% soil organic matter. The soil on the right, a soybean monoculture, less than 2% soil organic matter. If you do intensive monocultural, chemicalized, mechanized agriculture, you are destroying the life in the soil. Gabe is profitable with no fertilizer, no pesticides, no poisons. Using these cover crops that fertilize his land with what's in the air and what comes out of the cows and the biomass that is trampled by the cows. Minimal soil disturbance. Keep armor on the soil, keep living root in the soil. The cover crops put back in the soil, whatever might be lacking there. And enable you to farm without these costly inputs. Eliminating the costly inputs drops your cost. And as Gabe said, I'd rather sign the back of the check than the front of the check. The plants also cool the soil. When soil temperatures are high and in a warming world, they're getting hotter. The plants aren't growing. They're not delivering value to your farm. At 140 degrees, the bacteria is dying. At 130 degrees, you're losing all your moisture. At 100 degrees, very little of the moisture is available for growth. But at 70 degrees, 100% of the moisture is available for growth. 
These are the living creatures in the soil that are crucial to farm profitability, particularly, again, the mycorrhizal fungi. This is key to an agriculture that can feed the world. How do you preserve and increase your mycorrhizal fungi? Get rid of the poisons, get rid of breaking the soil, get rid of the chemicals, and keep the living plant cover as long as you can. When you do this, you are able to withstand the increased violence of the storms that we're getting. This was a storm in 2009. Gabe's neighbor's farm, all that soil is running off, taking with it whatever chemicals might be there and whatever nutrients are in the soil. They were able to absorb 13 inches of rain in 22 hours. This is Gabe's farm. You don't see any runoff. We're increasingly seeing dust storms, a return to the conditions of the Dust Bowl. Holistic management, regenerative agriculture, by using animals on the land helps to prevent these problems and makes you profitable. Gabe doesn't have to grow feed for the winter. He turns the cows out onto his cover crops and the cows convert them to dollars. He's then able to come in and drill seed his corn and soybeans. And he's run trials of fertilizing the corn and not fertilizing it. He gets his high yield without the fertilizer because the plants are doing the work of bringing nutrients to the soil. He is getting as higher, higher yields than his neighbor farmers that have dramatically higher costs because they are having to pay for all these inputs. This shows no-till with animal impact versus no-till without. The green bars are with the animal impact. It's the animal impact that makes this system work. And you can see over the years, he has gone from, when he went to no-till, he went from the 1.3% to 1.7, then 2%, 3, 4, 6 percent soil organic matter, 2013, 11% soil organic matter when he began adding in the animal impact. He has a diversity of products that he's growing. So if one fails, he has others. If you wanna know more about what Gabe is doing, you can watch this video, you can contact Nurtured by Nature, and you can mail order for his grass-fed beef and other products. Or you can read his new book, Dirt to Soil by Gabe Brown. My friend Seth Itzkin in Africa, implementing these same approaches. This is a different kind of a piggerator. This is in Zambia. They pick the cage up, walk it along, set it down where the pigs can root around and eat the grass. They've increased the sandy soil in Zambia from half a percent soil organic matter to 2.5%, five-fold increase. That's 9.6 tons of carbon per acre increase. Again, a percent soil organic matter is five to 10 tons of carbon per acre and 20,000 gallons of water holding capacity. And in a world that's getting hotter and drier, being able to hold water in the soil is critically important. If you want evidence on how this works, why it works, Seth has posted a whole series of peer-reviewed publications on regenerative agriculture. 
at this website. The big companies are realizing they need to start doing this. Unilever was one of the first committing to regenerative agriculture because they use a lot of soy oil. They want, if they were gonna meet their commitment to sustainability, they needed to get sustainably sourced soy. When they heard about what Gabe was doing, they said sustainable soy. Oh, that means we have to be implementing more regenerative practices. Danone, same thing. General Mills has committed to implementing regenerative agriculture on a million acres by 2030. General Mills has laid out six core principles of regenerative agriculture. So understanding your farm's context, the ecology of the farm, minimizing soil disturbance, maximizing crop diversity, keeping the soil covered, maintaining a living root, animal impact. Does this sound like Gabe Brown? Well, it ought to because General Mills hired Gabe to help them understand how to do regenerative agriculture. In 2020, an environmental group, the Nature Conservancy, worked with Cargo, McDonald's, Target to implement regenerative agriculture in Nebraska, creating a sustainable beef supply chain. Walmart has committed to become a regenerative company. Now they're figuring out what that means, but they'll come to the same conclusion that it means doing business in a way that enhances everything around them. Starting with health in the soil and then healthy communities, healthy people. So Chef Ann Cooper, she works with schools, bringing these concepts and helping schools create gardens so that the children can see where the food comes from and then ensuring that the, the food that the schools provide is nutritious. This is the basis of education, of learning, of healthy children. This approach is taking off with consumers. Consumers are realizing that grass-fed beef, grass-fed milk, grass-fed chicken, pasture-raised is healthier for you. This is the alternative. Conventional agriculture was producing what's called pink slime, hamburger that was the scrapings off the floor of the slaughterhouses. Really? Now you're hearing about plant-based meat. Do you really want to eat this? This stuff is made with genetically modified organisms, industrially grown, and it doesn't help solve the climate crisis. Here's what people want. Many Americans now identify as environmentally concerned. They want to eat at restaurants that care about sustainability. They want local and organic. They want energy efficiency in the industry. They want to eliminate waste, engaged employees. These are the top food trends. It's all the same stuff. Restaurants can be part of the solution. They can also be part of the problem. Most restaurants are incredibly energy inefficient. Food sourcing, the whole supply chain done industrially, conventionally, uses an enormous amount of energy and then produces a lot of waste. You produce waste when you buy food at the grocery store and then let it sit there and rot. 
20% of dairy and meat, 35% of seafood, 30% of cereals, 45% of fruits and vegetables are wasted. Cut that waste by 25%. We could feed everybody on earth who's now hungry. Most of the waste, once you've reduced it, but even the waste we have now can be recycled, can be composted. This keeps it out of landfills. When you put organic waste in landfills and it rots, it releases methane, a very potent greenhouse gas. It costs a lot too. We need to realize there is no way. I'm gonna throw it away. There is no way. So we can do community composting. This is an example from El Salvador that cut waste by 40% and helps the community grow more food. The star chefs are realizing that sustainability needs to be a key part of what they're offering. Restaurants are moving in this way. We can also grow food in cities. Cities like Detroit, where in many areas, people have left. A man named John Hans is proposing a, an urban agriculture, vertical agriculture that would hire people, bring healthy food to the community, use the vacant land, use renewable energy, use compost. In Cleveland, this is a failed mall, the Galleria, is converted to little local shops and food production. We can green our cities, growing food, having gardens on the roof. This is in New York City, greenhouses on the roof. Brooklyn Grange, growing food right in the middle of one of the mega cities of the world. Stephen Ritz, a teacher in the Bronx, is growing 37 kinds of vegetables using school kids. Doing this increased students in class from 40% to 90% increased student learning and engagement, created 2,200 jobs in one of the poorest neighborhoods in the United States. Check it out, Green Bronx Machine, really inspirational story. You can do this at home. If you have a lawn, turn it into a garden. If we combine renewable energy and regenerative agriculture, we can solve the climate crisis at a profit. We can provide food for everyone on earth. This approach of putting the two of them really together is called agrovoltaics. It's an example of how we need to begin implementing holistic solutions, regenerative solutions that give back more than they take that enhance the environment, that enhance our economy, and that deliver shared prosperity on a healthy planet. The UN's Sustainable Development Goals can be sorted based on starting with life, with the, the living earth, the seas, the land, solving the climate crisis, feeding everyone. And from this, you can meet all of the other UN Sustainable Development Goals. We can do this.